Okay, so it's just now 11:30. Um, it seems like we're we're stabilizing in the in the audience uh, number. My name's Alan Winery. I'm from the University of Hawaii, and I'm a co-chair of the Internet to IPv6 working group with Michael Lambert. <coughs> um, if you haven't taken a look at the initial slide here, you might want to scan it. Uh, I've uh, you want to there's a demo coming later in the talk and uh, you will want to have dynamic addressing and dynamic uh, DNS servers uh, configured on your devices in order to work if you have static set up they may hinder your progress or make things not work um, if you have docker or Microsoft Hyper-V enabled, you may consider disabling the vSwitch interfaces and or disabling Docker uh, networking. Um, like I say on the slide, I'm not really, I don't really understand that completely, but I have run into it and it, uh, disabling it helped. If you join the IPv6 Solutions SSID right now, it only has v6 connectivity, but it also gives you v6 name servers both via RDNSS and uh, and DHCP6, um, so you can actually use it as a v6 only in the in the purest sense wire right now. And if you're running Linux, uh, you might need to install RDNSSD, uh, which is a a daemon that listens on the wire, and if it hears router advertisements with DNS servers in them, it'll install them in your resolve.conf. So, um, a title slide, which I pretty much already talked through. <coughs> uh, a couple of resources that I may refer to. I'm going to talk about uh, Retivia.net uh, and Lee Howard's uh, V4 as a service uh, vendor, and he did a talk for the Internet 2 Working Group uh, in December and his video and slides is in the box folder which is the first the first item here as well as some other things Scott uh, Scott Hogue did a talk about uh, IPv6 and Amazon Web Services and then uh, uh, Stefan Lagerholm talked about IPv6 only in, in, in T-Mobile US <coughs> so feel free to poke around in there also the Hawaii IPv6 task force site uh, has links to this tutorial at, uh, in 2017 with uh, Jeff Harrington's talks on the IPv security and some other some other items. So, and the, the point of that slide is to get that information into the slides. Uh, so, what's the definition of an IPv6 only network? And a little bit, it's a little bit of a marketing ploy, but on the other hand, it's it's a little bit of a real thing. Um, what it means is that the local gateway routes only IPv6, no IPv4. Most routers and infrastructures uh, may have only IPv6 addresses. <coughs> IPv4 is offered to users as a service over IPv6. In this tutorial, we use uh, v4 AAS with NAT64 or 464XLAT. And although we may offer v4 addresses locally on the wire to users, uh, the, any IPv4 on the local wire is translated to v6. Uh, before it reaches the local IP uh, v6 gateway. So why do a talk on this? When I started in April 2017, there was a lot of small-scale DNS NAT64 how-tos for OpenWRT with inappropriate assumptions to inform the building of larger-scale production networks. Uh, and we began a, a conversation in the IPv6 working group uh, about <coughs> how to do um, what was NAT64 good for? How did you use it? How did you set it up? How, how, could, you, how could you exploit it to actually uh, use IPv6 to solve problems instead of being kind of a, kind of a political statement? And um, the, the, other, the other information that was available on the internet in April two, 2017 was various conferences, the ITF and APNIC and, and other networks had done, <coughs> excuse me, um, networks at their conferences and then written up uh, lessons learned, et cetera, about what, what had come to pass. Um, there was almost no coherent documentation about how to get NAT64 working on, for example, IO Cisco IOS XE or Junos. In fact, some of the Cisco documentation was, was entirely too informative because it took every possible meaning of the term NAT64 and permuted it and told you how to do everything. 
and it was r it was kind of hard at the beginning to figure out which w of the things you wanted. And there also hasn't been a lot of philosophy and vision groundwork for building and operating an IPv6 only production network. If you want a reliable, exhaustive reference, uh, uh, mercifully in English, for my for my POV, is uh, the Jewel website in Mexico is probably the best go-to place to just start learning about this whole realm of, of, of inquiry. Um, and <coughs> I'm also doing a talk because we're entering a time when IPv6 can stop just being an adjunct protocol and start uh, delivering on its promises and that's kind of what we're pursuing. There is more and more focus on this every day. There are other talks. Jordi uh, Pale Martinez is going to do a two-parter uh, following up. Um, and uh, the purpose of this tutorial is to show you how, to, how things work together and enable you to go home and do it yourself. Um, so the, the value of dual stack, retrospectively, when we started out doing dual stack networks with V4 and V6, there was kind of a, uh, an idea that we were going to build a V6 network beside our V4 network and Pretty soon there would be so much V6 built that we could start just kind of leaning over towards V6 and then turn off the V4. But that <coughs> isn't really coming to pass at this, you know, this week. Uh, but what has really been the payoff from 15 years of dual stack is that we've had an awful lot of operational experience with V6 networks. So we know how to make them work, we know how to configure them, and of course uh, that represents a path to understanding that you can't you can't get by discussing it in a working group. So the other thing about dual stack is it adds IPv6 as an alternative to making th things work with NAT. And if you look at uh, what's available on IPv6, big content is is very much available on IPv6. Your uh, uh, Netflix and your uh, uh, content distribution networks, uh, Limelight and Akamai and and uh, uh, Cloudflare, and, and uh, those things are now available on IV6, IPv6, and that's an alternative to doing to reaching them through a natted uh, uh, six four or a natted IPv4. Um, it, it's it's coming time to build experience, which is what this this talk is for, uh, with IPv6 deployments that deliver on the promise, uh, shift existing v4 address space into a v4 as a service role, and let the solution to IPv4 problems be clearly uh, to enable IPv6. And I, I'm a little frustrated with metrics. Uh, the metrics that people see, the metrics that journalists cite on the internet, and what you see is a lot of maps that show almost nobody is deploying IPv6 and a lot of uh, uh, percent of world traffic graphs and, and, and um, there's a lot of numbers that are rounded to zero. I have another talk uh, called uh, Campus Networking in the Post IPv4 Exhaustion World where I talk about how I see backscatter IPv6 from a lot of countries that supposedly have zero percent deployment. And, um, and I've really gone and, and traced and, and, and verified that the packets are coming from those countries. But if it's, if it's, uh, if it's the fact that they actually have any deployment at all, if they just have an experimental deployment, then that's not zero. And that, that's something that, the, for instance, the Google Maps should be showing. <coughs> so one thing that they don't show is the proportion of requested content that v6 clients w uh, receive over IPv6. And if you only see the percent of world traffic and the penetration per country, you would never suspect that that proportion is right about half. So <coughs> this is <coughs> uh, three graphs from uh, 11 days ago on the, on the UH network. The top graph is uh, flows per second. Green is IPv6, red is IPv4. The middle graph, uh, the top graph shows that flows, the flows in IPv6, flows per second is about 34% of all flows. Um, from, I should have, well, from a wireless zone on our campus. And the middle graph is packets per second. 
that is about 59% IPv6. And the bottom graph is bits per second, that's about 53%. So the first, the first thing that kind of comes to mind is that V6 flows tend to be packet, uh, packet numerous, packet heavy. There are a lot of packets in a V6 flow versus what's in the typical V4 flow. And you can probably explain that to some extent by the fact that YouTube and Netflix and streaming services are all V6 enabled, um, as, well, as well as some other things. We also, there's everyone on, this, on this, these networks is also doing uh, their G Suite, Gmail, and, and uh, Google Apps and things over V6. Uh, so that's in there too. Um, I should, I should probably stop digressing. Uh, so this zone is a, it's a slash nine of global IPv4 address space. This is one of six zones on our campus. Across the campus, we currently have applied 100 slash 24 equivalents in global V6 space. Now, when I came to this a couple of years ago and asked the wireless guy, you know, how many clients are alive on our campus at one time, and he said 12 to 15,000, I said, you know, it sounded like you said 12 to 15,000. <laughs> so um, we have 12 to 15,000, and we're committing that much address space to it right now. Of course, things are going to change, but that's just an indication of the explosion of, of addresses, the explosion of devices present on the campus. So what is the value of an IPv4 address? Well from ipv4auctions.com, which I do not intend to promote. I just Googled around and found something. Um, perhaps somebody can suggest a better, a better reference. But our 100 tw slash 24 equivalents are worth about a half a million dollars US. So let's call it $20 an address. Um, if you assign IPv4 addresses to end users, the address can be used for five to 20 flows at a time, typically. If you assign IPv4 addresses to NAT, the address can be used to in up to 50,000 flows at a time. Uh, so there's really no comparison between, you know, per, per interface addressing and, and NAT. But and I realize, of course, I may be the only person in the room that has this huge globally addressed IPv4 wireless system on my campus. But... You also have to consider that all of your, your router interfaces and your device management and all of that stuff on your, your, your network is also using V4 addresses at the cost of $20 a piece. Um, so you can recoup that value and you can uh, push V4 addresses towards V4 as a service. You still can't deal with zero IPv4 addresses. You need something to do V4 as a service unless, of course, you outsource uh, Rutivia.net is the, as far as I know, is the only V4 as a service vendor in the world right now. Um, I guess that gives them 100% market share. Uh, so, um, and I'm going to give you more reference to that a little later. So at U University of Hawaii, we've been dabbling in the art of NAT64, DNS64 since July 2017. Several of us have done our work through uh, such a setup on various days, noting some issues. Um, but g getting the work done, uh, we have provided V6 only networks to various groups at various meetings and conferences. In fact, uh, uh, there was a HIC concert, uh, conference, the Hawaii Internet Consortium Conference, and I had the V6 only AP configured, and configuring a dual stack AP would have been more work, so I just threw them into the <laughs> the V6-only network, and I got through the conference fine. Uh, because I do all, everything, I do follow up with the, with the, uh, the literal handling. So, I pr and plus I personally have been using IPv6-only with IPv4 as a service as uh, in my office for about 19 months. So my, um, my desktop that I have plugged in and the switch in my office is only only has a v6 address uh, or only can reach the the internet by v6 and it's not been a great big problem there occasionally things pop up that I want to blame on the new kid but I haven't really followed through and, and discovered that they really are to but the one of my the most interesting ones was I made a 
I made a Hyatt uh, hotel reservation, and then I came back a week later and I needed to cancel it. I couldn't cancel it from my desktop. I had to use my phone to cancel it. So, uh, and there, so there are little things like that. But of course, if you just use the internet, there are little things like that all the time anyway. So, but it seems like most of the problems come up with really complicated self-referencing web app stuff like that. So. Um, another one of the schools in the Internet 2 group, University of Michigan, has really taken up the charge with NAT64 and DNS64. They're running F5 big IPs, uh, which uh, you can look up. I, I looked it up last night. It's, a, it's an application, like load balancing kind of a, kind of a deal. Um, they're running a virtual machine specifically for NAT64 with Joule. Uh, it's in use by the network operations staff, which is most of the people that are using this kind of thing. It uses, they're just using Google's DNS 6.4, which is possible if you use the default prefix 64FF9B. And they put a slash 29 of IPv4 on the front of it. We only have, we have a, a, a whole slash 28 on ours. Uh, NAT 6.4 was very easy to get running on F5 and seems to be quite reliable. Hot by standover uh, is, is available, but they don't have it turned on right now. And it's, um, I've got this, <laughs> I've got this, uh, a few virtual machines connected to a switch with VLANs and stuff, and he's got two Juniper EX9214s in a, in a, in a failover configuration. Um, when I say this, he, it's Brady, I, I, I don't, I didn't want to give all the credit to Brady, Brady, because I'm not sure he's done all the work, uh, but, um. But uh, there's some really smart people at the University of Michigan uh, doing this. Brady is the reporter, and he's the one that made these uh, these pictures and stuff. He's got high-speed logging into Splunk, so he's got this whole uh, address assignment thing that, that uh, the help desk can look at. He's saying that uh, training would be required to get the help desk conversant with the dashboard the, and the host appliances connected to data center routers, yada, yada, yada. So... Um, they're talking about putting on their main campus SSID, as are we, um, <coughs> but it's something you probably want to do between semesters at night <laughs> to, to start with. Um, UC Santa Cruz, uh, University of California at Santa Cruz, has deployed IPv6 only in 2018 using NAT64 and DNS64. They originally built a bump in the wire CLAT device which is, I, I probably should explain what it is later. Um, <coughs> but I never got around to de deploying it since it doesn't seem to have been an issue. I gotta say, I was sitting in my hotel room two nights ago with just NAT64 and DNS64, and I worked for hours and I didn't run across any problems. Um, so the, you know, the campus bind servers are doing DNS 6.4, which is very easy, I agree. And then uh, they're doing their NAT 6.4 on an A10, 1030S. So the things that do NAT 6.4 commercially tend to be letters followed by numbers for some reason. Um, <coughs> and uh, A10 has a partnership with Infoblox. So they've got some devices that do uh, pretty fancy load balancing stuff with DNS 6.4 and, and et cetera. Uh, Right, and they're they're serving their DNS server uh, numbers by both Slack and DHCP6, or DHCP6, yes. So Virginia Tech Transportation in, in Institute, uh, uh, Clark Gaylord reporting, he's got, uh, he's looking at Palo Alto to put uh, NAT64 in their, in their lab network. We also have some Palo Alto devices. We like retired some from our I, uh, the IPS role that we like to try stuff with. And uh, he also has HPC clusters, and he's been messing around with uh, IPv6 only in HPC. And he, he kind of points out that uh, HPC is kind of prisoner to the NAT model, where the head node is, is doing some sort of, uh, as he says, an accident, <laughs> the accident of a head node doing poor NAT for, for an HPC, which is kind of sad when you have a high-performance computing cluster. Um, and he, uh, the, he is excited about the possibility of de decoupling the scheduler from the topology. Um, right, and he's got a presentation in the box folder, uh, mm -hmm. well, slides from the presentation of the box folder. 
and uh, they do all kinds of interesting stuff with uh, smart automobiles and stuff at Virginia Tech uh, Transportation Institute. So to talk about doing it yourself, uh, we had a, you may look around, you may have boxes if, if, if you do, as I said, had a retired Palo Alto or an A10 or an F5 or something, you might be able to get it to a software rev that's uh, capable of doing this stuff. We had a Cisco ASR 1001, which was sitting on a shelf with NAT64 capable software. <coughs> and it took me a while to find instructions and, and to fiddle through getting it going. Other universities, as I said, have used Palo Alto F5, A10. Uh, we up, I had to upgrade the iOS XC on my Cisco 4500 that my, my cubicle is looking into as a router to get our DNSS on a user segment. So there may be uh, upgrades to get up to the place where you can serve router advertisements with DNS servers. Uh, we've had a V6 only SSID on our building Wi-Fi for a couple of years. I did also build a, a 60 NAT64 on a stick with a Raspberry Pi, um, back when Raspberry Pis only had one interface. Now, now most of them have their, uh, an additional wireless interface. And it's, it's not simple. You have to compile modules. I compiled the Joule modules for Raspberry Pi, but if you find the right, the right uh, procedure, you can get through it. Um, we could have done, of course, a DNS 6.4, NAT 6.4 with the ASR and Google's DNS 6.4 or with Joule and, and Google's NAT 6.4. So the value of doing IPv6 only is, first of all, operational simplicity. You only have to support a single stack. You only need resources for one route table and one address translation table and, and the other things, caches and buffers and whatnot. We actually had a a chain of Cisco 3750s uh, on the big island of Hawaii that got overwhelmed by having both routing tables for a while. And we actually had a, a resource exhaustion problem with dual stack at one point, but we, up, we changed them out for Junipers. Um, plus lower carbon emissions, you can be green. So I suggest whenever you advertise your V6 only efforts, you put a little green leaf at the, in the corner, you know, a little icon. Um, for security standpoint, you only have to worry about one. Uh, you can reduce the configuration complexity and and uh, not have interference patterns between the two and uh, keep things simple. You only have to do things once and all of your IPv4 policy can be concentrated at your NAT. Um, it, this limits the, the deployment of real IPv4 addresses so they can be used efficiently. It provides direct non-NAT connectivity to IPv6 connected resources, which is a larger proportion than you might think. The, the answer to all problems when you've got a V6 only network with V4 as a service is to move it to V6. And if we get people to see that as the economy, then we'll be in a lot better position for V6 deployment. And your commitment to V4 deployment gets shallower rather than deeper. So V4 as a service refers to providing V4 content to access to V6 only hosts. It's kind of generally, if you go Googling it and reading about it on the internet, if it's not me or Jordy or you know, somebody, it's, it's usually they kind of talk about it like a futuristic concept. So how do we declare when it's time? Well, how about now? I mean, I'm, I'm really serious because you're either gonna put energy into CG NAT or you're gonna put energy into this and this has a has an exit strategy a strategy for v4 so I mentioned retivia.net they're a IPv4 as a service provider Lee Howard was formerly the ops manager at Time Warner Cable the service market is right around one provider uh, presently we had a presentation which I mentioned which is videos and slides are in that box folder and he he talks about a lot of different things. I met him at Nanog in uh, Denver last June, and that's how we came to have that presentation. So when you get started talking about V6 only and V4 as a service, people generally, are again, are talking about the future. Well, I, I just need to, we kind of need to cut off the, cut off the speculation, and the game we're playing today is that we got 
we have to have this done by next Friday at the close of business. And uh, the boss has declared that we've got to do this network, and either because we're short on V4 addresses or we have a mission, uh, something to prove, we're going to do this for this meeting that we got next week. So we're, just, we're talking about solutions that are available to us to deploy in a space of the next week, which may assume vendor donations or it may not. Of course, I think if you call your, your Cisco salesman and tell him you need NAT 6.4 by next week, he may not know what you're talking about. If he does, he gets a you know, gold star. Um, perhaps assuming open source Linux-based routers and stuff. And I, I put some focus on, <coughs> throughout this effort, a focus on how to do like for real Linux routers and how to do for real Linux appliances that do stuff. Because it is possible to optimize performance and it's possible to make them do well, but you have so much versatility and flexibility in, uh, in Linux uh, compared to a commercial router platform that it, it's just really attractive for many reasons. Our, our primary goal is uh, positive experience, positive user experience. <laughs> Elegance is a very li low priority. The morally right way to assign DNS or address or, uh, to, to devices is a distant conversation. We do admit that breaking DNSSEC is something we'd rather not do, but also that nobody would notice. Um, in the how-to document for this, I have, I have some details about going through, I think it was 8 million DNS lookups over one day and finding absolutely no devices that were doing hard uh, validation against DNSSEC. I did find recursive resolvers that were asking for it, but, um, and that doesn't mean we should ignore it, but it also doesn't mean that it's going to be a problem between now and next Friday. Anything interesting and new that we should that we should wait for is just not on the table. So there's a couple sites uh, that you can you can try to visit. I I uh, I was not having luck with v6 connectivity on the Apricot Net. I don't know if anybody else is. I hate to I hate to declare that, but. Um, so v4o.2.uhnet.net is a site that only has v4 resources, and v6o.2.uhnet.net it only has uh, v6 addresses or v6 resources. Both are using public addresses, so you can reach them from anywhere. Right now, if you join the IPv6 solutions SSID in this room, you'll be able to reach v6o and not v4o. Um, and then there are browser plugins uh, at the bottom if you haven't heard of those before. But most V6 mavens have already have it installed. That's a picture of the V4-only web server. Uh, so experiment number one. Uh, so I, at this point, if you haven't, I'd like you to join the IPv6 solutions SSID. And uh, it offers V6 connectivity, and it gives you access to a name server that gives you, uh, via V6, it gives you any kind of responses. So you'll get A records and quad A records and whatever other records you ask for. Um, it offers Slack and DHCP6 and user addressing. And content is sparse but surprising if you know where to look. So um, at this point, you can take a, little, a few minutes and, and revel in the... Uh, in the true v6 only experience so there are uh, many things let me get the other mic hello at any time if you want to ask a question these mics are up here and if you grab one you have to turn it on as you just saw me demonstrate so uh, if you're on that, the, the local IPv solutions SSID, you should be able to get to v6o, where you'll see a Studebaker commander and a Tucker torpedo. You may also see a durian fruit. Does anybody see a durian fruit? Okay. That's part of a, an offshoot from a discussion in an IETF mailing list where they were wondering about ways to make sure that you do not have v4 enabled on a network and what came up in that discussion was uh, 
um, link local v4 link local addresses, which uh, everyone has seen. It's at 169.254.0.0 network, and nobody has ever used to any good effect that I'm aware of. But on that v60 page, if you do have a link local v4 address, you will see the durian fruit. <coughs> So yes, if, uh, if you see durian fruit, you must jump up and raise your hands and say, hey, I see the durian fruit. But you can try CNN, Netflix, YouTube, Fox News, Al Jazeera, Google. Um, and when I say perhaps with not with external auth, that's because we use the G Suite and our, author is, our, our authentication at the University of Hawaii does not have V6, so uh, you, uh, but if you log in on a dual stack network and then change to a v6 only network you're still you're still authenticated um, yahoo is there wikipedia xkcd uh, acm apricot.net aaron right etc cetera, etc cetera. Uh, but there's actually quite a bit actually and and applebees for some reason when i was originally doing this the only restaurant chain on earth that has IPv6 enabled is Applebee's, which isn't as funny outside the U.S. as it is inside. But um, we've also found a couple others. Buffalo Wild Wings was one of them. But it's, I think it all has to do with who their uh, CDN is. <coughs> so, so anyway, yeah. Uh, oh, also, there's this star at the bottom that says include streaming. When I was at home in my cubicle, CNN streaming works, but it does not work in Korea. So, uh, I, I, which is complicated, but there it is. So, one last thing is you can also craft numeric addresses r versus DNS lookups. You can type in 64FF9B colon colon and then the dotted quad for a V4 address and you can uh, reach pretty much anything you want to reach. Because although we're doing v6 only with no helpers, <coughs> the NAT64 is alive and it's reachable. It's just not, being, it's not having traffic driven to it by DNS64 at the moment. You can actually exploit this treating as 64 FF9B, uh, uh, et cetera, as a v6 address, as in HTTP with the brackets. Um, which I have used to fix a few problems that have come up uh, along the way. I actually have, so as, as long as you can reach a NAT64, you can reach the other side. So, and there, there are a couple of public NAT64 trials out there, so if you have those in your head and you're, you're on your V6 network and you need to reach the V4 network, you can, you can cheat. <laughs> so, and, and if you work with V6 and V4, and things that may or may not have a name server on them at the moment when you're doing network engineer stuff, that's actually kind of a cool trick. So, of course, there are going to be, uh, there, there are other schemes for doing v6 only. And uh, uh, I suggest you go to Jordy's first talk, about it, or hear more about that. There's DS Lite is a big one, which requires CPE uh, uh, fiddling. And, um, but the reason we're doing DNS 64 NAT 64 here is because it's the most widely implemented and mature. It uh, does not require you to alter end user devices at all. It uses regular commodity hardware. There are implementations of every piece available from multiple sources, uh, pretty much. It's got a record of success. T-Mobile is doing essentially what we're talking about today on their US network uh, countrywide. And although the NAT64 holds state, it, does, it really doesn't affect network topology, um, as I'm going to try to try to emphasize. To exclude it, if you want to exclude your NAT64, if you want to stop using it, you just stop driving traffic to it. Okay, so it's not an inline thing. There's a lot. One of the problems with a lot of little open WRT how-tos that you find on the internet, if you Google around, is that they kind of make it look like NAT64 is inline and all the traffic flows through it, and that's how things work. Well, it's really not. You just put it on your network, it's reachable by V6, and then you drive traffic to it, either by crafting a numeric address or doing DNS64 or some other new thing that somebody has thought of or hasn't thought of. <coughs> um, 
but the the way to picture it in at 64 is to is a v4 as a service construct it's a uh, it's it's a thing on your network that you route to and the way that we drive traffic to it is with dns64 so dns64 rfc 6147 it comes as a feature in bind and uh we we actually have an info blocks you know highly available info blocks multi node thing but we also have a bunch of uh uh, any cast servers across our state and I network that are actually just Linux boxes with bind running on them. So we have we have a <coughs> excuse me investment in bind. Although Infoblox also does DNS 6.4, but um, it's really really easy to set it up in bind once you get it once you get your mind around it. It ex it assumes the existence of a compatible IPv6 IPv4 translator. When it gets a request to resolve a name that has no quad A IPv6 response. It responds by synthesizing a quad A response and encapsulating the A records response's IPv4 address into a V6 prefix per RFC 6052. And synthesis must be reversible. Not really sure why I put that bullet in there, but that's in the RFC. Um, you may do reverse uh, pointer answers for it. I th when we discuss this in the, in the working group, there are a lot of people who just insist that reverse lookups aren't even important in, in the world in general, um, but then there are some things that rely on them. <coughs> it theoretically breaks DNSSEC even though it doesn't lie. Uh, the number of end ho host resolvers that ask for validation is very small, and DNS 6.4 clients are not current, well, there's no such thing as a DNS 6.4 client, but clients are not uh, currently designed to under uh, to understand synthesis nor act on it, but if they were, it's reversible. They have all the pieces that they that they need to do the validation from a v6 uh, uh, a quad a response. One interesting kind of <coughs> uh, supporting tidbit is if you look at those browser plugins, the ones uh, like the one in Chrome that shows you how much you get whether you're getting things from v6 or v4. <coughs> If it sees a 64FF9B address in the list, it will tag it as V4. <laughs> so uh, it's just an example of decoding the decoding the address and, and seeing what it really is. It's really V4 as a service rather than V6. So here's the purple part is pretty much everything you have to put in your in your name D dot, uh, conf options to to enable DNS 6.4. Uh, there are are several keywords and the 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 ones that I've decided to put on the slide the important ones clients uh, means an ACL identifying clients that get DNS 64 behavior from this server so you can control who gets a DNS 64 response by what the source address is there's uh, mapped which is an ACL specifying IPv4 range of a responses not to synthesize for a recursive only um, if this server has authoritative zones, if this is like your main name server where you're serving out author authoritative zones, then you can tell it not to synthesize for those, or you might tell it to synthesize for those. And then there's a break DNS sec uh, com uh, command, which is if a client requests DNS validation, ignore it and send it responses regardless. So, um, you can live. It's really easy to configure. It does not. It's not. It's very easy to unconfigure. Um, but again, you might have uh, you might have problems with just going on your big, uh, busy recursive name server and turning s and inserting something experimental like this. It's also easy to keep on a separate server. It, you can also serve DNS 64 from either a v6 or a v4 address or both, and we'll touch upon that later because it ends up being a possible solution to the Android problem. Um, <coughs> you can put a DNS server on a V6 only network, but if it has no V4 connectivity, it needs to forward to a V4 connected server because there are many domains, believe it or not, that still don't do V6 uh, uh, connectivity on their name servers. So I, I learned that the hard way. I was happily building V6 only networks and I built a new one where the, the, the name server was entirely V6 connected and it couldn't reach most things. And, but with these, th that stands at the bottom of the slide, it, it became whole again. <coughs> There's also a whole discussion around 
I think it's a V6 ops group and ITF and and others about if as it stands a bind server is configured for DNS 6.4 will respond to quad, to quad A requests and will respond to A requests. It, it gives you what you ask it for. If you ask it for A, it will not respond with that synthesized quad A request because that wouldn't work. That's not what the, what the client asked for. And um, so uh, there still might be something that because it wants to make eyeballs happy or it's just a legacy, uh, legacy system like Windows 7, which is st still pretty numerous, um, you, it might be cool to stop admitting that there are A records. Of course, there are probably side effects to that too. So, uh, but that's, it's just a quandary that, that exists. I'm not suppressing any responses uh, today. So, you may, if you think through this, you get to the point where you say, well, this is just NAT. I'm just doing NAT, why don't I just continue with my CG NAT or my regular old NAT 4.4? Because NAT 6.4 is NAT that shrinks rather than NAT that grows. This is kind of the mantra of the, of the movement. And uh, because the more V6 that gets done, and there's more V6 getting done every day by content providers, but uh, then the less NAT you will need. So, <coughs> uh, It's better than dual stack because the more you shift to v6 only networking, the less you spend on precious IPv4 addresses on a building a network, which is a flawed statement because dual stack actually does shift v6, does shift traffic off of the NAT, as uh, Dave Farmer at the University of Minnesota keeps pointing out. They, they actually do CG NAT for f for v4, and then v4 v6 is a, is a dual stack, and that gets pretty much all of the job done. But then CG NAT begins to insert problems on the V4 side because of the multi-layers that you have in there. And uh, there, there begins to be things that uh, problems to solve with CGNAT. <coughs> so as IPv4 addresses become even more expensive and more scarce, uh, providing native IPv4 addresses on per interface assignments becomes unthinkable. So you may be flush with V4. You may have enough V4 right now. You may have just bought some V4, but I have met uh, a college CIO who had a slash 28 of V4 to the organization's name. And uh, that's, and actually they got a donation of V4 address from a neighboring college and that was, uh, this was in the Pacific. And but that kind of solution is not is going to cease to be available as time goes forward. There are going to be people who come into the internet as a new as a new citizen, and and there's just not going to be the options for V4 available that there have been in the past. <coughs> uh, so there's also a statelet NAT64, uh, <coughs> otherwise known as SIT. And it's a stateless one-to-one -one address mapping. It provides, in fact, we're, we're going to do it a little bit today. It, it provides for such things as making your IPv4 servers look like they're doing IPv6 um, or vice versa. And it's probably most often going to be superseded because rather than go to this trouble, you're just going to enable v6 on your servers, uh, of course, unless you're the network guy and the server guys won't listen to you. But um, but it may prevail as a glue technology for long life I IoT. There are things out there that survive a lot longer than network equipment, like you know microwave uh, uh, system and uh, HVAC telecom management power systems. And uh, there's going to be these V4 only things on your network that just have really long life, and it's one way to to deal with that. And stateful NAT64 is what we're doing. What we're going to do presently. And that's uh, pretty much what I've described. If you have an IPv4 address as shown, you can stick it on the back of the 64FF9B uh, prefix as shown, and then you get that, uh, that synthesized address. So we have had, we actually retired the ASR, uh, but we had two, two routers running at one point. And the ASR was uh, 
perfectly good and capable of great capacity and, and uh, is probably, you know, I'd hate to even say this out loud because I don't know, but it's probably more scalable than a Linux router. But uh, without the test, who knows? <coughs> and then we have an Ubuntu 16.04, which shows you how long ago I did that, uh, to NAT64. And so there is a later version of Joule, but it's, it's really exhaustively documented. Even if you don't want to deploy Joule, uh, going to their website and reading the whole thing is the best way to, you know, go to NAT64 University in a hurry. So this is a little bit about how Cisco con configures NAT64. You can see the uh, uh, NAT64 enable right there. And uh, we're not doing neighbor discovery and et cetera, et cetera. Um, and also NAT64 enable, and we hooked it up to IP, IP, OSPF. The r I also did uh, redistribute static, which is something I had to figure out because uh, it, when you configure NAT64 on the Cisco, it you the way it instantiates the things that you configured, it actually puts them in as static routes without telling you. <coughs> And it's got this logging feature. You turn on logging and it sends net flows. And I captured them with the NFSEN and looked at them and uh, uh, they don't look like a net flow. So I stopped doing it. I'm not really sure what they're, what they're supposed to provide. Um, but here's a picture. The first route, the 64FF9B, I did not add that prefix. It just assumed that that was a prefix I wanted to use first. And then uh, it's inserted a static route for it. And then, uh, and of course, look, it uses the 100, it, it uses the, the fake, uh, I can't think of the name of it, but it's a CG NAT thing, the 100 NAT as its internal routing for that. And then um, the second, it, that's a documentation prefix, but uh, to make the point, if I haven't already, 64FF9B is the well-known prefix. You don't have to use that. The reason I'm using 64FF9B for a tutorial is it's very easy to spot when you're reading a slide and you recognize it immediately. But in real life, you may very well want to take a slash 96 out of your own address space and put it on there so that you can reach it from, from anywhere. And if you have a, a local exchange, you might take an address space from the exchange and use a piece of that so that all of the exchange peers can, can reach it. Um, and it was just a, how to show some statistics from NAT64. And it shows packets that have been translated. <coughs> so Joule is at Joule.mx. It's pronounced like the English Joule. It's a Mayan word, not a Spanish word in case, in case. It seems like most, it's like Jordy's name. All these, all these <laughs> words with Spanish speaking people, you want to, is that, Jordi or Jordi? And so, yeah, so Jeffrey Handel tells me you're, it's a Catalan name. Yeah, okay. So I asked Jeff Handel about all the Spanish stuff. And uh, so uh, I have it set up in Ubuntu 16 or Raspbian 8 to good effect. It's the only Linux based set NAC64 solution that I have tried, but it's the only one I've been tempted to try. There's Tega and uh, uh, one that starts with an E. And they're either two user space or two undeveloped or uh, uh, not to badmouth them, but, but there it is. And th uh, uh, Joule 3.5 has undergone T-Rex testing with good results. It's, it's actually been load tested pretty s extensively. Uh, so yeah, so NAT64 on Linux uh, with Joule 3.54 is the one I'm currently running. One needs to prep Ubuntu like a router translator and you can do one arm NAT64 pretty easily. In fact, it's Effortless. There's one armed isn't any more complicated than two armed. <coughs> um, the following assumes that you have separate interfaces. <coughs> Excuse me for coughing. I I was in the polar vortex in Indiana a few weeks ago, and all that cold, dry air has left an impression. Uh, so this is just an rc.local, the refuge of cowards. Uh, I should probably do some of this in other files, but. Uh, this gets it done. You turn off uh, offloading on the Ethernet d uh, drivers, um, and then you uh, mod probe Joule and tell it what the pool is. Um, 
in fact, that's not the pool we're using today, but that's what I have in the slide. And uh, then you add into the, the, uh, the V4 pool, you add addresses and a port range, a federal port range that'll be able to, that will be available for uh, NAT. Uh, syscontrol.conf on the, on the Linux jewel box. You want to turn on forwarding v4 and v6, and then you want, uh, I actually change the ephemeral port ranges because on this little translator box, you're not going to have a lot of outgoing connections to UDP and TCP, so you can commit more port range to NAT and therefore uh, enhance your, your NAT per address uh, capacity. <coughs> um, and then the interfaces file is a Debian Ubuntu thing. Uh, actually, I put in uh, for each address that's in the NAT4 pool, I, uh, I put a, a, a sub interface. So it's, al it's also don't, pu don't put the address, don't, you know, when you're typing through and adding a number, don't, don't include the broadcast because Jewel will happily use it and the router will not happily respond to it. There's a Jewel user space command versus different from the module but has the same name and you can do things like show, show the, the, uh, the IPv4 pool on, uh, from the command line. So NAT64 is a service on the network, as I've said. I export the routes into our OSPF and then to any IPv6 connected host can use it, pinging an IPv4 address by hand mapping into a NAT64 pro uh, prefix is thus. Um, of course, you might want to think about limiting access. There is a security angle to this. You don't want to take a, a translator that's effectively a, a spoof-o-matic machine and uh, make it open to the entire Internet, although several are. Uh, it would be interesting to talk to them. There's one in Slovenia that's been on for years. I wonder if they've had uh, flood attacks. Also, another little wrinkle is save you some time, perhaps. Neither of these NAT64s that I've worked with can reach themselves from their own command line. So you can't ping 64 FF9B address when you're on the Cisco or on the, or on the Jewel on that 64. So experiment number two. So I'm going to take a, a, a moment and enable DNS 64. It's hard to type when there's 60 people looking at you. Okay, so I restarted bind, and the, the uh, so I what I did was I uncommented the DNS64 stanza, and then restarted bind on the on the DNS server. <coughs> so it's probably difficult uh, to find something that this won't do. Testing and. Um, So it's way too high for me to reach. APAN provided a laser pointer. Um, so the DNS64 is now a DNS64, and you all have that. Uh, you should have that either by DHCP6 or by our DNSS. And so that if you <coughs> uh, ping 6 v 40uhnetnet you will get a synthesized answer for that, I sure hope. And um, uh, or or ping if it's just Windows, you just do ping. 
There's also a Linux ping in the wild that actually is dual stack, and it's there's been almost no fanfare about it, but I've run to it here and there. Um, but that's pretty much. Yes. Oh, I'm not doing CLAT yet. Oh, you are doing CLAT. I'm only doing, this is only NAT 6.4, yes. So, uh, But that shows then that that is still not working. Yes. Right. So, right, you could ping 8.8.8.8 or 1.1.1. Is it 1.1.1.1? That's one of theirs? One, 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 nine, 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 nine. Or 8.8.4.4. So, anyway, uh, everybody recite your Google name servers, boy, um, from memory. But um, let's advance. So <coughs> I suggest loading the V4 only web page. You will now get a web page and you'll get an orange. I should probably have a picture of that. Um, uh, but you won't get an apple. Or you, you probably won't get an apple. Because at this point, uh, there are several modern OSs and browsers and et cetera, which actually have a, a clat built into, the, built into the OS. Android is the the canonical success story in that regard. Um, but also, Mac OS's uh, Safari browser will do uh, internal clap. Yes, and I don't get it. Is anybody having trouble? get it now. And Android. So Android gets an apple and an orange. Uh, if you have a, if you happen to have a Google Fi phone, I found that Google Fi tends to mess with your, mess with your protocol stack to the extent that it's really bad example of something you use in a demo like this. Um, <coughs> but Many of you, if you're just using Windows and if you're using uh, Chrome on Mac OS, if you're using iOS. Uh, so who sees an Apple? Nobody? Oh, a few, yeah, okay. So what, what OS? Yeah, okay. So uh, it may be that Safari does that under iOS too. Um, <coughs> And I really need to do a regression table, like periodically, of which OSs are doing what and what browsers. Uh, but, but there it is. Um, yes. All right. Yeah, you get an orange. But if you lack, if you lack the apple, it should be both. If you lack the apple, that means that your OS is not doing any client lap. It's so Android is saying. Oh, I have no V4 address, but my but an app just asked for a V4 resource. So Android hijacks that request and makes it into a it it makes it into a translated V6 packet and puts it on the wire. And iOS is Safari and macOS Safari. Um, I don't know if, what browser are you using. Oh, okay, you're it's an Apple. Oh. Well, we could uh, spend the rest of the day looking at this. And I really need to get, like I say, I really need to kind of systemize checking for this and, and do some, some, publish some results. But uh, there it is. So if you encounter failures, mostly, most likely called by IPv4 literals, which are numeric IPv4 addresses embedded in HTML or in software, and since numeric addresses do not require an address lookup, they're not they're not resynthesized by DNS 6.4. So you uh, get the switch. There it is. It takes yeah. a moment. Um, my name is Awal. Um, I'm just uh, thinking if you can go back to the previous slide and show us the flow of uh, yeah. traffic. That would be very helpful to okay. understand. Yeah, thank you. All right. So.
remind me to give this back to you, but uh, or come get it or something. But I may need it again. Uh, so. And I've kind of talked through this slide already, but that's a picture of Android getting the Apple, even though it's only got uh, uh, V6. Oh, here. The reason some operating systems uh, or browsers are getting the Apple is because there is a new version of Happy Ables. Okay. Uh, Happy Ables, uh, RFC, uh, I don't see the number, 8. 8305. So this version of Happy Ables is about a couple of years old. Uh -huh. Apple implemented it before becoming an RFC, so they experimented with of our course. devices all the time. And uh, because that Happy Ables, uh, what it's doing is when it detects literals or something that can be translated to IPv6 only, it's doing inside the Happy Ables machine. Yes. Okay. So that's okay. the reason that works in most of the okay, so that's browsers. Where we get browser -based stuff. It's it's like equivalent to a silat. It's bump. I think it's bumping the host, the actual uh, wording. Okay. Well, we've we've coined bumping the browser for that behavior. Uh, yeah. Because because the OS as a whole doesn't get it. Right? Exactly. Yeah, so okay. So that's that's the reason for that. <coughs> All right. Very good. Um, so on to four six four x lat we. It's it's a superset of NAT64. It includes NAT64, but it it, uh, it, can, it can be a transition strategy in, in by itself. But we kind of pervert it from its original intention as it was written into the RSC, and we take pieces of it and use those pieces. Um, it uses a simple form of SIT NAT46. Uh, pay attention to the order of the numbers to clean up residual IPv4 requests from software as such as hard-coded uh, v4 literals and send them to NAT64. It employs two pieces. There's usually a, there's a client lat, which may be built into the host. It may be built into the browser. It may be built into the wire. Um, and then there's a provider uh, piece, which uh, is is the NAT64. So I'm sorry, I didn't notice you. Oh, no worries. Go. Anurag Bhatia from Hurricane Electric. One quick associated question. Uh, you mentioned that in case of Android, it would do the translation for an app which is hard-coded to use IPv4. So how it works out for things like, say, a VPN? Because uh, one of the problems I often find on my Mac is when I try to use VPN, which has a hard-coded config with IPv4 yep. over a V6-only network with DNS 6.4, it fails. Because the config has hard-coded V4. Sure. Uh, if I do the same in an Android, in the same network, will it going to work? Will the Android that's hijack? A, well, that's a super good question. Um, we could look it up. But you know, I fixed that very thing by going into the config and making it a map 64FF9B address mm -hmm. with, with brackets. Yeah. I fixed a VPN like that. And, and uh, there's a slide later on about how you kind of get have to get good at picking up those extra pieces. Yeah, I can always always use DNS. It's just that it's, it's better to have it hard-coded right. because sometimes you often find hotels or some other places <coughs> fiddling with the DNS, so it makes more sense right. to hard-code an IPv4 address so in, in such scenarios. There is also a, there's also a, a, a code split from, from the Android thing called CLAT-D, which you can run on Linux, and it might you'd have a little more facility with trying things at a, you know, on a real laptop, but because Android is Android, you know. Does it work on OS X? I'm sorry? Would it work on OS X, the Mac OS? Very probably. Okay. That's one of those OS X yeah. questions. Huh? Yeah. Oh, okay. Right. Oh, that's true. Yeah, right. But is Jewel set up to actually handle the whole CLAT function? To Because CLAT-D tells the OS, give me your stuff, right? I don't know. Okay. Uh, we are going to use a virtual machine with Joule inside any host. Okay. I guess you can recompile Joule under macOS and do the same. Yep. I yep. didn't try it, but well, then again, that's a that's a Linux kernel module. So if anybody is really, really, really smart, uh, pick that up and let us know how it works. Right. Thank you. <coughs> okay. Um, well, let's move on. People don't say 464 CLAT, although I notice people do. But I kind of started saying that, and I warned people that if you go to the ITF, don't stand up in a working group and use the word CLAT. 
although they'll know what you mean, so maybe it's better. I also, you're not supposed to say NAT64, but I will if I haven't already. <coughs> so, so uh, moving on to the next piece, uh, which is the clap bit with Joule, the Jewel SIT module, which is a separate module from the Joule module. And SIT is really just a more, or a simpler, a simpler version of the same thing as NAT64. Um, so on syscontrol.conf, you got uh, turn on v6 and v4 forwarding, rc.local, turn off offloading, start the module, and then you set up uh, uh, fake v4 sources and maps to the v6 source. Uh, now, notice that we're using a different <coughs> v6 prefix because what we're doing is we're taking local v4 packs and we're, we're translating them, we're shipping off to the NAT64. So we need a source address to come from, and uh, that's <coughs> that's what that is. Uh, DHCP, I I set up DHCP on and now so this 464xlat clat thing is actually a device which resides on the same wire as your as all of your devices is uh, the same wire as the as the IPv6 solutions SSID. And it will hand out RFC 1918 addresses, V4 addresses, and then it will become the router and become, um, it could become the name server. It does, it, this one doesn't. Um, but, uh, but that's it. So, and then any time, since it's setting itself up at the, as a local router, whenever it gets a packet, it'll use Jewel SIT to translate it to get it off, off wire over to the NAT64. So experiment three, using a dual SIT module, as we just said, yada, yada. I repeat myself constantly. So I'm going to take a moment and turn that on. And yes, why not? making sure the demon started, which it does appear to be. So at this point, you should unjoin the SSID and then rejoin, and that'll cause you to re reassert, re-ask for DHCP. <coughs> and it's, uh, the day is not long enough to find things that do not work with this, with this setup. Um, and of course, you may not have found anything that didn't work with the previous setup, but this cleans up almost all of the, of the outliers. So uh, v4o.toot.uhnet.net, once you've rejoined the SSID, you should be able to see all the fruit at once and uh, with, with absolutely no exception. So, uh, and so th what's there, while I got my other thing here, hello? So what's happening now is if you have, so these guys all have private V4 addresses, as you can see, the little red blob. And uh, the client machine, when it has a request to make over V4, it will go on the wire. This guy is, is the DHCP server, which has set itself up as the router, and it's also a NAT4.6 translator. So uh, the packets will go here, and then they'll get sent right out to the NAT64, and then the same, the same flow will happen. Um, <coughs> so uh, it's, it looks slightly inelegant, <coughs> but <coughs> and as Mark, Mark Belushin said in the UC Santa Cruz thing, they've ju they're just doing it without this uh, on, their, on their SSID, and they're 
they're perfectly happy with it. However, if you want to introduce it to a large user population uh, so they can do anything they want, you there's a lot of mobile phones and, and uh, laptops and tablets and et cetera, whatever else there is. And uh, so you would do a lot of bang for buck by setting up a reasonably beefy clat device uh, bumping the wire and handling all those, uh, those things. Now, the, the method of setting up things on the host is really cool, and I, I'm, I'm looking forward to hearing Jordy talk about that, but it's also not something you can do with a, a 6,000 user population on your Wi-Fi. So uh, we have talked about such things as putting a, a hefty server out in, the, in a, next to a, a layer three router out in a building on campus, and then you give it a trunk from the, the router, and then it can be the clat on all you know 16 different uh, nets at the same time. <coughs> so, so IPv4 only devices work. In fact, at this point, you don't need uh, you don't need Slack for Android anymore. If if for some reason that's a problem for you, it's easy to do DHCP, and you can. You, but you, it's not easy to do Slack or you know uh, router advertisements. You can just let Android flow through the the CLAT device, and um, uh, so we have left IPv6 DNS adverts from the router active for the experiment three. It's no longer. Uh, that's what I just said. I thought it was something else. So if DNS is not on the wire you will use translation space on DNS queries. So that, that raises this whole question of should I be forcing everyone to use my DNS 6.4 or get off my network? Uh, so because people are gonna come in with things configured statically. If they're real nerdy guys, they're gonna have, uh, I can't even think of the name of it, but there's, there's a fancy DNS stuff that people subscribe to and they turn it on on their laptop and, and uh, and, they, and then they talk about it in, in working groups. But there are various reasons why people might want to define another name server, or they might just have one of the, the many Google name servers defined for whatever reason, because it makes their life better. And uh, they come on your network with that defined. Now Google also has, as we've mentioned, a DNS 6.4 that's available. <coughs> um, but but there there are questions to answer and policies to to set about DNS on your network. Uh, so the implications of four six <coughs> excuse me four six four CLAT support for IDNSS is actually not as widely offered as we would like. Uh, for Cisco, it's pretty much exclusive to iOS XE, and I have. Uh, we have an awful lot of 6500 sitting around now, and I just don't think they're ever going to offer it for 6500. So um, it actually sort of is a problem. Uh, it's, it actually s sort of is a problem for if you want to cover the, the, the Android case. Um, there's also the question of whether or not you could s sort of uh, use li something like Scapy, the, the Python. Uh, packet crafting toolkit to spoof RDNSS on the wire and pretend you're the router, which I, I used to do for when we had uh, uh, rogue routers on our, on our wireless network. I used, to, I used to tell them to shut up with Scapey. That was, that was a lot of fun. Uh, so there's questions about that. I actually have tried it a little bit. I just set up a, a, a RAD VD on a, on a Linux box and put it on the, on, the, on the wire and told it to behave like it was the router and the, uh, the end, end devices did not like it at all. They immediately just complained and said, nope, nope, not taking that. Which if they'd done that 10 years ago when we were having rogue router problems, it would have been nice. Um, <coughs> so if you're in the clap for stray IPv4 literal business anyway, you may have well have put a forwarding resolver to DNS 6.4 on the clap. So if you offer a DNS 6.4 with a v4 address, you can pretty much pick up your Android and not not run all your traffic through the clat, through the clat. But then you can, uh, it will do its its uh, DNS 6.4 resolution and use v6 uh, more, pretty much the same as anyone else would. Um, we've.
kind of covered this, but we're using Linux with Joule, OpenWRT with the LAT plugin, uh, XLAT, 464 XLAT plugin, uses Tega, uh, which is simpler than Joule, but it can do this, and it runs on small, cheap hardware, which if that's what you need, it's what you need. Isn't it? Because ClatD does. I just read. I just read yesterday. It said that this thing uses Tega. It may be. It may have been old. Okay. Well, we'll we'll clean that up. I, actually, I did put that in the slide. Darn. I could say it's not in the slide. Um, <coughs> and then there's bump in the browser, which we saw Safari was doing for the for the the Clat eyeballs thing. Um, <coughs> and I really need to start publishing results. So there are various things you can do with NAT64, especially if you craft numeric addresses. Like I talked about, I had a VPN which, for whatever reason, wasn't working out. And I tend to configure things like VPNs with numeric addresses anyway. Um, but uh, you can often put a V6 address in the form of 64FF9B, uh, et cetera, into those things, sometimes with brackets and other times without brackets, and fix things up. Here I have a, this is my, uh, this is my driveway at home, a uh, picture of it. And the security DVR is kind of an interesting case where uh, if you use a V4 address, it hammers a 464X lad. It just puts a bunch of traffic through there. The browser, the in-browser app receives the numeric V4 address from the browser, and then uh, DNS64 synthesis does not work because the name has a quad A response, which is not port mapped on the V4 only DVR. Um, which is a whole mouthful, and I, I understood it when I wrote it. Um, <coughs> but interestingly enough, if you synthesize an at64 address, the browser app sees an at64 IPv4 block, which means it interacts with the at64 and without the 464x lat, and things start working. So there's often a, a way to paste things together, and it's just you're going to break things with your CG nat, or you're going to break things with this, and there are ways to follow up and get good at at plugging holes. Uh, so, um, kind of a list of stateful NAT64 manufacturers, uh, Cisco I and iOS XE on certain router platforms. It's not in all iOS XE platforms. ASR is a, a one of the one of the platforms. Then ASA. <coughs> NAT64 tends to appear on things that are more like firewalls and security appliances and load balancers than it does on routers, although I think Juniper routers also do it. Uh, and then, of course, the, the, number follow the letter followed by number class of devices. Uh, acknowledgements. So M University of Michigan, Brady Farber, did a lot of work with NAT64. He's been uh, part of the discussion in the IPv6 working group, and he did that that big glorious deployment that I, I showed a couple pictures of, including the, the fast Splunk logging. Uh, Virginia Tech uh, Transportation Institute, Clark Gaylord, uh, who's uh, been a part of the discussion and is uh, working on using Palo Alto for 6.4, writing up experiences and talking about HPC and, and V6 only, which is interesting. UC Santa Cruz, Mark Belushin, uh, has been working with A10s there and uh, is uh, pushing, uh, Contributing to the discussion, Craig Miller, commentary research. Craig is a colleague of mine from the University of Hawaii who went to work for, let me get it, oh, Bay Networks, and then Bay Networks got, by, got bought by Nortel, and they moved him to Canada. And so now, 20 years later, he's living in Victoria, B.C., uh, retired, but he contributes to the uh, V6 uh, task force page. Jeff Handel, who uh, was part of the original uh, tutorial development and uh, is always uh, offering good input. And then at the University of Hawaii, Chris Zane, Matt Tachima, and Ward Takamiya is Chris's group, including me. Um, <coughs> and uh, they've all been very uh, uh, willing to try stuff and to participate in the experiment. So are there any final questions? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, here. I sent you at the beginning of the session, I didn't recall it before, I sent you an email with a couple of documents from B6 Ops. Okay. One of them is uh, precisely for vendors of CPEs to support IPv4 as a service. This is becoming an RFC in weeks. It okay. passed already the ISG approval. 
The other one is uh, NAT64 464X LAT deployment guidelines. That's a still not an RFC, it's, it's a draft, it's the third version, but okay. it's adopted already by V6 Ops. Yeah. The other comment is, um, you mentioned the case of T-Mobile. Yep. Uh, if you want to, to know numbers uh, in terms of percentage of IPv6 traffic in T-Mobile, right now, uh, that's, that was mentioned by Cameron, Cameron Byrne, I guess you know the name. He's the, the one that deployed IPv6 in T-Mobile. They have right now uh, using uh, 464XLAT uh, already 75% of the total traffic being IPv6 only. Right. Uh, they have 24% uh, using the, the NAT64 and only 1% because the literals using the CLAT. Okay. Are you suppressing A records? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> so that's, that's a statistics which I think it, they are interesting to know because it shows that if you deploy IPv6 only, you really get less and less and less traffic in your NAT64 <coughs> or in yep. your CGN or whatever you are using instead. Yep. So it's a good alternative. And um, the last comment is uh, you mentioned about the DNS64. Um, most of the people don't realize that even if today is true that DNSSEC is not widely being implemented, the cases where DNSSEC will be broken is only if the end hosts are doing their own validation, right. okay? So the possibility, the, the percentage of breakage is minimum. But even if that happens in your network and you really want to support the NSSEC, the advantage of 464XLAT is that you can run it without the NS64 and problem gone. That's true, yes, okay. Yeah, just to add some regional perspective, uh, lately what we are seeing in Asia Pacific is most operators going dual stack. Um, Reliance Geo, uh, probably one of the biggest, Chuma Telecom in Taiwan, the same, uh, Bhutan Telecom, where I come from, the same. So I think it depends on what network they have. Uh, and them making this choice also says something. So and in their address supply situation. Yeah. Yeah. So, so, so I don't think there is one fit all kind of thing. Uh, 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 they know their network better than others. Uh, they know their sure. problems better than others. So, so I think it should be left up to folks to uh, uh, to decide what is well, better. Sure. Of course, ideally, it would be nice to have V6 only. Jordi, I know you're <coughs> a proponent, uh, and I agree with you on many things. But this part of the world, people seem to do it a bit differently. Um, and I'm sure they did the assessment and all, so oh, just, I think just wanted to add that. Let me respond to that. <laughs> the problem here is when you do dual stack with CGNAT, which is probably what they are doing, the usage of IPv4 addresses, of public IPv4 addresses, is much higher. So your investment in CGNAT boxes means that after a couple of years, you will need to buy more IPv4 addresses. Because even if I have dual stack, happy eyeballs ensures that things go over V6, preferably. Preference is always over V6. But I'm not going to have to keep adding CGNAT upon CGNAT, right? It's a net, NAT offload concept, uh, 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 like uh, he was mentioning earlier, right? No, of course, of course, right? right. But but <coughs> reality is also important, yeah, I think. So, <laughs> well, there's. I'm willing to commit to say that everyone should be trying it, because then you, then you have experience with it, and and if everyone's try it and has an experience with it, then it becomes more common for it to be something in your toolbox to continue with, and maybe, do less CG nap in the future. So, thank you. Uh, just a quick comment, uh, Tashi and Jordi, uh, I do not support either of the mechanisms, so I'm not in favor of V6 only or dual stack. But just a point, um, what Tashi is saying uh, actually has issues. So when you run dual stack network, and that actually is proven by Appenix IPv6 stats, whenever people do not dual stack all their sessions, 
V6 does not really work well. So you can always have issues, and, and if, you, if you go to some of the larger operators, including the one you just mentioned, back in 2016 and 17, there was a lot, lots and lots of, uh, uh, lots and lots of traffic for Geo was supporting IPv6, but was still going over V4 because of high latency. If you have a case of V6 only, that would suffer, that would suffer, it won't save it from them, but it would still go over V6 and would be easily noticed by the operator. Probably in, a, in such a scenario where you have, say, not so optimized routing when you are starting up, along with the fact that happy eyeballs will just take the load away, you will never realize how, how bad dual stacking is, is uh, across the edge routers. When it comes to asymmetric routing, it's a matter of how you treat your V4 and V6. If you treat them the same as a network engineer, uh, shouldn't have cases of asymmetric routing. Bhutan Telecom, the network I worked for for so long, we don't see problems there. So I understand there are problems, but asymmetric routing is not a problem of V4 and V6. It's how people treat the two. Yeah, it's more around people uh, trying to deploy V6, but just by dual stacking one or two sessions, not by completely dual stacking everything. So how many people in the room are, have their own ASN or working for an organization with an ASN? Can you raise a hand? Do you dual stack your V6 exactly as your V4, or is it different? So if, you, if, you, if your V4 and V6 routing is exactly the same, can you raise hand? You see the difference. Okay, so anything else? Well, thanks, everybody. We should probably head for lunch. <laughs>